thank you all for coming today and people are still joining us. Uh, so today we have uh, two talks on uh, the dipole dipole interactions and first uh, resonance energy transfer. First would be given by Jerome Wagner, who is a big uh, specialist in that and a leader of the nano bio uh, group in uh, uh, institutional as far as I know, right? Uh, yes, we, we can. <laughs> but, uh, uh, as, as long as we, we define a group by just a, a few people. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's, that's we, okay. I, I will, and, anyway, okay, I will, I will, I will start. Um, I plan to, to pause something about 25 minutes, something like that. Okay, I would monitor if there are any questions in, uh, in, from the participants. If anyone uh, can, has a question, you can raise your hand in the, in the chat or and I will notice it and ask Jerome to, to pass the question to Jerome, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, no problem. Great. All right, uh, so I start, okay, I have my, my pointer. So today we're going to talk about uh, energy transfer, dipole, dipole, energy transfer. So the plan is that I start the presentation with optics. So molecules are, are, are going to be our dipoles. Uh, energy transfer will occur uh, at uh, hundreds of terahertz frequency uh, and we, we talk about fluorescence energy transfer. Uh, so we, we decided to start with, with optics uh, uh, because that's more the, the historical introduction of, of, of energy transfer uh, for microscopy at least. Uh, and, and then we will go on with, with KSAT, we'll, we'll give a, a second talk. Uh, more centered uh, about LDOS effects and, and what's going on uh, at microwaves. Um, so energy transfer in, in optics and spectroscopy, uh, chemistry and biology is widely accounted for Foster Resonance Energy Transfer. So that's the acronym of FRET, uh, introduced by Theodor Foster um, in 1946. Uh, and, and this is essentially what governs the energy transfer between a donor molecule and an acceptor molecule when they are separated at a distance long enough so that there is no direct electron transfer, so a few nanometers, so typically two to three nanometers, uh, but short enough so, so that a dipole dipole interaction does occur. So that uh, typically the distance is between three and 10 nanometers, and this is where. Um, this uh, resonance energy transfer occurs. The donor absorbs the energy, uh, the optical energy by, by light, uh, and then transfers its energy to the acceptor. And finally, the acceptor will release its energy and, and, and emit light. Uh, so this is the one core principle that, that is in photosynthesis. So plants get this type of energy transfer uh, every day to, to get their energy. And this is also widely used in molecular biology because, uh, as I will show you later, this is a tool that has been extensively used uh, with single molecule techniques over the last 20 years uh, to monitor protein-protein um, interaction, protein-DNA interaction, uh, molecular structures. Uh, so for physicists, um, FRET is the dipole-dipole interaction. We have an excited dipole, we have a receptor dipole, and we're going to see how the energy goes from the donor to the acceptor. Um, but for physical chemists, uh, FRET is another um, decay rate that is matching. So um, this is the energy level of the acceptor die, ground state, excited state of the donor, gets populated by light. And from this um, higher excited state, then the donor can either emit a photon, this is the radiative rate, go down to the ground state by internal conversion, or uh, if the acceptor is close enough and if the energy level of the acceptors are matching somehow the energy level of the donor, then in this case, it can transfer the energy from the excited state of the donor to the excited state of the acceptor. And one important thing here is that this is radiation-less. So the, the main concept of FRET is that everything occurs in, in the near field. So this is dipole-dipole interaction at a distance that is much, much uh, smaller than lambda or even lambda, lambda over 10. So that there is no direct emission of a photon from the donor here that gets absorbed by the acceptor. This is what we call radiative transfer, but this is not FRET. FRET is the direct interaction 
at very close nanometer distance. So why FRETI is so much popular is, is because it's, it's highly sensitive to distance. The, the, the FRET efficiency scales uh, as the distance uh, one, uh, as one over the distance power six. So this is the, the typical curve that you have for, for FRET uh, as function of donor acceptor uh, separation. Uh, you have a certain FRET efficiency, which is essentially defined here. Um, FRET efficiency is the probability that the donor gives its energy to, to, to the acceptor. Okay, for an excited donor, what's the probability that the acceptor gets the energy? This is the FRET efficiency. So at very short distance, it's uh, nearly 100%. Uh, at distances more than 10 nanometer, it vanishes, so we have nearly, nearly nothing. And in between, there's what we call the foster radius. It's uh, the, um, the distance at which the energy transfer is about 50%. And this, the, the slope here is very sharp, and the, the size is, is very well matching the size of the molecules. So, so molecules interacting with each other, molecules changing conformation, anything that induces a distance change of a few nanometer will change quite dramatically the threat efficiency. As you can see here, moving from four, we have 80% to six, we have 40%. So that's, that's a huge change in, in the threat signal. So it's very accurate. To, to monitor distances um, on the nanometer scale and, and e even below the nanometer scale. So it's well matching the, um, the, these molecular dynamics questions. So the question we are asking today is, is can we go beyond uh, and improve the threat uh, process using nanophotonics, so, so using nano optics. So what we know from nano optics is, is that, uh, for instance, using plasmonics, using um, uh, a tip, a sharp metal tip, for, for instance, we can increase locally the intensity. So we can increase the excitation rate. Uh, sorry. We know also that using the, um, the Purcell effect, we can modify the radiative rate of emission. We can also, by bringing um, uh, metal quenching also, we can increase this non-radiative rate. So all these things uh, can be modified by uh, a metal nanostructure, for instance. I'm going to speak about plasmonics here. So using metal nanophotonics, we can modify this, this, and, and this, right? Same thing for the acceptor, of course, we can modify the radiative and the non-radiative radiative rate. And finally, the question is, what, what's going on with this guy? Can we change it with nanophotonics? And how, and, and is there a linear relationship between this thing and this thing? Or is there a quadratic relationship or no relationship at all? So that was some of, of uh, the major question. It seems quite obvious that yes, indeed, we can change it, but then the, the question goes to, uh, has to how to do it and, and, and what's the, the best choices to, to optimize this. Um, if I go, uh, I'm, I'm not going to put many equations, but if I just put like one equation, uh, it, it, threat turns out to be quite simple, actually, uh, at least conceptually. We have a donor. The donor is generating an electric field, and there's an acceptor at a certain point. So the donor is going to induce a polarizability in the acceptor, it's going to generate a current. And the amount of energy that goes from D to A, the power transferred from D to A, actually it is going proportional to the polarizability, the imaginary part of the polarizability of, of the acceptor, times um, the, um, the intensity, the, electric, the modulus square of the electric field emitted by the donor, at the position of the acceptor, all right? So uh, the only thing we need to know is, is actually to, to know this thing. And this accounts not only for the radiative part, but also for the evanescent field. Uh, and since uh, the distance between A and D is pretty short, the evanescent contribution is going to be extremely large. And this is going, what's going to, to matter most. So at the end, uh, what we want to, to know is how does nanophotonics modify uh, this quantity? Uh, the local electric field generated by a dipole at another position, which is at a, at a given distance in the near field. So there, there have been lots of studies uh, and quite um, significant debate in, in the community about, about all this um, uh, over the, the recent years. It was introduced back in 2000 by, by Bill Barnes. Uh, 
in, in Exeter using minerals. Um, and in this case, he saw a, a freight rate enhancement and the influence of the cavity on the energy transfer between dyes. Uh, this experiment was reproduced uh, the same year and one year after by two other groups, and they confirmed actually that there is indeed an, an, an effect. So, uh, using this cavity, it seems that uh, we can change uh, the threat rate, and this scales with uh, the donor lifetime. So, this scales also with the local density of states. Uh, the issue in this experiment is actually that they used quite dense layers. So uh, self-quenching between acceptors is, is not negligible. Um, donor energy transfer between donors is, is not negligible also. And even more, there might be a collective effect. So the donor is not seeing a single acceptor, is seeing a collection uh, a multiplicity of acceptors. Uh, so that requires more experiment down to a single molecule level. So to a single molecule level, we have been doing experiments in nano apertures and nano antennas. I'm going to speak about these two. Uh, and to cut the story short, yes, indeed, we saw some threat uh, effect uh, using nanophotonics. Uh, but it's not always the case. Uh, and, and many of the studies, like, like the three uh, I'm showing below, did not see any effect at all. Uh, and actually, the, the question was, um, uh, the question behind the, all this, this talk is, is there a relationship between threat and elders? This is my title, okay? Do we have uh, a relationship between the threat rate and, and the total local density, the partial local density of, of critical states? Uh, and, and everybody at some point thought that yes, there must be some general law that applies all the time. Uh, it turns out that the answer is, is that such a general law does not exist. Uh, it's not that, that simple. It depends on, on the configuration. Um, uh, and, and, it's, and it's not always the case. For instance, here um, in this experiment by the group of, of Willem Voss, um, they used a, a silver mirror and single molecules in front of a silver mirror. And in this case, there is absolutely no effect detectable. If you want to see an effect on the freight rate, it's possible, but you have to go to very, very short distances. And what it shows is that it's not correlated with the elders. Um, in this experiment, they, they changed the refractive index. So, so um, again, the refractive index influences, it's a prefactor in the elders. So it's um, a certain way to change the elders. Uh, it's not the way I prefer because it does not use back the self fraction of, of the field on, on itself. But definitely, it's, uh, it affects the, the total lifetime. In this case, they didn't see any change in, in, in threat. And lastly, this experiment, they use a cavity, uh, but with single molecules. So this experiment is very close to this one, uh, but here it's done to a single molecule level. And in this case, here they didn't see much effect on, on, on the threat. Uh, and here again, they were using quite short distances between donor and acceptor, and this might be a reason why they didn't see something. So this is just basically to illustrate that, yes, indeed, there's quite significant literature on, on, on the topic, um, some contradictory results, uh, but actually the contradiction is, is essentially because people want to see a, a general relationship between threat and elders, and it turns out that this relationship does not exist, because if you go back here, the threat is proportional to um, the modulus square of a field, and this is proportional to the modulus square of a green function, while the LDOS is proportional to the imaginary part of the green function. Uh, so uh, imaginary and modulus square might be related in some cases, but not always, not always. Uh, and this is why it's, it's making things a bit more complicated. So we are doing uh, experiments to, to see that. Uh, the things we like uh, is metal nano holes. So we have uh, circular nano holes milled in, in gold or in aluminum. Uh, generally, we prefer aluminum because it's, uh, it's more broadband for the visible. We, we are playing with green and red fluorescent and dyes, so, so aluminum matches better for the optical response. Case. Gold is, is good in the red, but pretty bad in, in the green. Uh, and then we are putting uh, DNA molecules um, inside these nano holes. Um, these DNA molecules are designed so that there is one donor and one acceptor. And the donor acceptor distance uh, is designed at a well-specified distance. 
So we control this by, by DNA synthesis. Okay, so there's just a single die here um, for the donor, single die for the acceptor. So this is our, our two dipole dipole, uh, and they're on a fixed double strand uh, system, which should be quite rigid. Um, another just uh, scheme, um, single hole, 110 nanometer diameter. We excite from below, we watch what's going on uh, between the, the, the two dies, and, and we record the, the thread. So threat can be recorded in optics by, by several ways. First, we can see what's the acceptor emission uh, in presence of, of the donor. Uh, so we just record the, the photon burst. And this is typically what we see here. The other approach what, that we have uh, in this experiment is that we also monitor the donor emission. So is there a drop in the donor emission and how fast it goes the donor emission. Due to the presence of the acceptor, the donor emits faster. So the fluorescence lifetime is actually reduced. And this is another way, uh, an independent way to, to monitor. So two techniques to measure threat, uh, one with acceptor brightness and one with donor lifetime. So we do these, these recordings. Um, here you have a reference in this column um, for, for just a glass cover slip. So this is our diffraction limited microscope. Uh, the donor, the acceptor, uh, and, and the threat, we see bursts. Every burst is just a single molecule that, that is passing. And in the nano hole, we see brighter bursts uh, in all the different channels. Uh, so here again, these are single molecules. They are brighter, uh, typically eight times for the donor, 12 times for, for the acceptor. Uh, and this is due to, to the plasmonic enhancement that, that we have in, in, in our system. So based on that, we can analyze uh, all these bursts uh, and see what's the threat efficiency and compute the histogram of the threat efficiency. Uh, in this case, we are playing at very large distance, 13.6 uh, nanometer, sorry, this nanometer here. So it's pretty large distance. Uh, in this case, the threat efficiency is very low, only nearly 3%. So we are, we are putting the, the dice far away. Uh, so it's really the limit of what we can detect using a, a classical microscope. And already here, we have to be extremely careful to, to, to see it. But our sample is quite well known, well characterized, so, so we, are, we can be very confident in, in this case. Uh, and here you see, uh, to cut the story short, uh, you see the gain introduced by the structure. We can improve the threat efficiency, not a lot, uh, but typically three times, up to eight, eight percent. And we can make something more detectable. So something that is quite noisy and quite hard to see here on the thread. Thanks to the different enhancement, then we can make it brighter and improve the detection at large distance. Okay. And we control, we do, we do lots of controls to see that indeed it depends on the structure. It depends uh, on, the, on the sample also. So we'll come back on, on, on this later. But just to, to mention that there, there's a lot of controls uh, behind. We can also see things uh, in, in, the, in the fluorescence lifetime, and this is really a sign, a signature of, of threat, is that in the presence of the acceptor, uh, the donor lifetime is, is shortened. So when you bring the acceptor, you create a new decay pathway, which is the threat rate, and that you can directly measure uh, using fluorescence lifetime. So uh, if we have radiative transfer, donor emitting a photon being absorbed by the, the acceptor, then we would not see this, this type of effect. So in the end, we can, yes, indeed, plot uh, the threat rate uh, versus the donor, um, the inverse of the donor lifetime, so uh, the total donor decay rate if the donor was alone. And we see uh, a linear relationship. So in the case of the nano holes, uh, well, we could claim that there's, there's indeed a linear relationship between LDOS and threat rate. But this, again, is not a general relationship. It just applies in that case. So at the end, if we bring something, uh, we can end up with some general conclusions, at least for, for the nano holes. Um, it's quite tricky, okay? Um, we have to be careful. It depends on two major parameters. It depends on here, uh, the donor acceptor distance. Uh, and it depends on the second parameter, which is the nanostructure. So basically, if the nanostructure, the diameter is large, then you go back to um, the, 
a confocal case, the diffractional limited case, and there is absolutely no gain. Okay, uh, hot color here is thread gain. Uh, and you have the enhancement of the threat efficiency, and dark color is quenching. So, so this is a type of, of summary what, what we can try to benchmark and obtain a, as results. So, of course, it depends on the structure. So, it depends on the diameter. If the diameter is too large, you don't see anything. If the diameter is too small, essentially you have losses. So, okay. So, for small diameters, uh, the donor gives immediately this energy to the metal and this is taking the lead, and then we lose everything. Um, but in, the, in between, yes, there's some sweet spot where we can see some, some optimization, all right? Uh, but this, again, uh, depends on the second parameter, which is the donor acceptor separation. If the donor, uh, if the acceptor is at short distance, below five nanometer, basically there's nothing, okay? You, actually, you can even have um, a, a loss, okay? Threat gain below one, you have a loss in your threat efficiency. And here, essentially, you have something that is already extremely efficient. A is close to D, then the threat is very efficient. And by bringing the metal and the nanophotonics, you just disturb the, the phenomenon. However, if you, if you go to a larger distance, then the gain seems better and better and better. Essentially, because the direct energy transfer is pretty low. And in this case, the influence of, of uh, the nanophotonics can be increased. So right now, uh, here I wanted to show you something about um, nanoholes. But we, we did something where we have better control on the position of the acceptors and, and the donor. Uh, here, everything is moving in, into the, the structure. So we, we do not control the position. We do not control the orientation. So here we have done uh, something where we control the position, uh, a pair of um, gold nanoparticles. Uh, they create a dimer antenna. We have a donor, single donor, single acceptor. We know exactly where their positions. Uh, and we're going to see what's going on to, to cure on the threat on these systems. So again, we can monitor the bursts and make sure that, yes, indeed, there is, um, we see threat and, and, and there is uh, both the donor and the acceptor die present. Uh, and we can see in this case, very strong LDOS. So the LDOS enhancement for these structures is typically higher than a, a hundred fold. Okay, so these are highly resonant gold nanodimer antenna. So they accelerate the donor lifetime by a hundred times. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have still some effect on the threat, but it's much weaker. Actually. It's typically four to five times, okay? So there is indeed an effect of nanophotonics on the threat rate, but it's not correlated directly to the LDOS. Uh, and this is another clear example where showing that there is some effect, but it's pretty hard to, to see. And it's not likely correlated to, to, to the LDOS. And of course, if you increase the LDOS, um, sorry, I lost my pointer. If you increase the LDOS uh, a lot here, uh, if you increase less threat rate, then in this case, actually, you lose uh, the threat efficiency. Threat efficiency is the ratio of threat rate enhanced five to a threat rate plus well, a term that corresponds to the LDOS. And this guy is increased 100 times. So of course, we are going to shrink completely threat efficiency. Okay. And this is indeed what, what you observe in, in this case. So that shows that using nanophotonics, we need to control a clear balance between increasing the threat rate uh, but not increasing too much the over decay, um, radiative and non relative decay of, of the donor. If we increase this guy too much, then of course we lose everything. And, and this is again confirmed by our, our, our uh, simulations using Mi theory. Um, this is from this formula. Uh, okay, so um, electrical field generated by the donor dipole located in the middle of the gap, modulus square. Uh, so this is a gold nanoparticle, this is the other gold nanoparticle, and this is the map of uh, the E square uh, computed using Mi theory. At the position of the donor, you see that there's uh, are clear different zones. Um, in these zones, um, the threat uh, is enhanced, but not that much. In this position, it's a bit better. Typically six times, we measure four to five times. So we are not far away. Uh, here, it would be even better, and then it really depends on the positions of, of the systems. So this is an example where we control better the, the position. 
And uh, okay, so we confirmed this with aluminum nano gap antenna, but I'm not going to, to uh, discuss more. I don't have time for, for that today. Um, the last thing uh, I wanted to, to discuss is that it depends on the position, uh, acceptor relative to donor. It also depends on the orientation. So uh, you have a donor dipole, you have an acceptor dipole. If the two dipoles are parallel, then the threat is going to occur more efficiently. If they are perfectly aligned, okay, perfectly aligned is, is like that. Okay, so then the threat is going to be increased even more. If they are just parallel, like, like that, it's still working fine. But if they are perpendicular, then normally you have zero threat, at least in homogeneous condition. Okay, in threat, this is called with uh, kappa square factor. Um, if everything is um, moving freely, randomly, then this factor is two third. Uh, and this is directly controlling the threat efficiency. So if, if this is one, then we're going to increase. If it's zero, there's no threat. Uh, and we could monitor this uh, using molecules. So that requires a lot of, um, of calibration, but we didn't do this, this thing. We, we just reproduced um, results from, from this paper, um, from David Lilly uh, as group. Uh, using Sci3 and Sci5, donor acceptor molecules, uh, they stack to the, um, the DNA if we choose well the, the DNA sequence and, and, and the, the linkers. And with that, depending on the distance, we can set them that they are nearly perpendicular. Okay, so we have two samples, uh, A and B, where the orientation is nearly perpendicular. We should have a threat efficiency of 80%, but we detect less than that. Of course, there's still a bit of wobbling, so we still see some energy transfer but it's damped by, by more than, than a factor of 2.5. And in this case, sorry, um, then we can see uh, what's going on. So, so this is the reference when the two molecules are moving freely, uh, adding the nano hole or the, the nano antenna, at, depending on the short distance here, we see a drop. Actually, these are the losses due to the metal, but tend to quench the threat efficiency. But if we go to this case, where they are nearly perpendicular, the threat efficiency is lower, but then uh, adding the nanophotonics, then we can increase this threat efficiency and counterbalance the loss, but tend to, to take us down, but increase it more, essentially because again, um, as I told you, it all depends on the electric field projected on the acceptor dipole, um, but, is, but is emitted by the donor dipole. In free space, if you take the component perpendicular to uh, the plane of, of um, the donor dipole, you see nearly zero, okay, there's no electric field emitted. But if you go in, an, in a nanophotonic environment, then you have metal, metal is going to scatter light, uh, and in this case, you have coupling along X, Y, Z component of light. And in this case, you create some, some electric field intensity distribution that is no longer zero, okay? And this is where you can create new threat routes uh, ensuring that uh, nanophotonics can, can help to go for these nearly perpendicular configurations. So I come to, to the end of, of, of my talk. I just wanted to show you a bit what um, the state of the art, the knowledge in, in optics. There is quite a lot of debate. The experiments are, are not that easy. Uh, we are playing like with molecules. Uh, they don't emit lots of light. Uh, they are pretty sensitive to uh, quenching and, and photo bleaching. Well, at least we can start to, to give some, some general conclusions and, and design principles. So yes, indeed, it's possible to use nanophotonics to improve threat uh, at certain conditions. It does not work all the time. Uh, and here I'm trying to summarize what conditions we, we know. So we need to have, uh, it depends on, on the sample that you use, the, the antenna, uh, antenna sample. Uh, it also use, depends on the threat sample. So for the antenna, you need to drive strongly the donor uh, dipole, of course. Um, we need to get a lot of light and that's, that's working much better. Uh, but importantly, you have to balance between the, the losses also. So if this is increased too much, uh, then the threat rate uh, is, is, is going to be increased also but not as much as the losses. And in this case, you will see a, a drop. Uh, importantly also, it depends on the sample. Uh, if you remember my, um, sorry, if you remember this type of cartoon here, it shows it, it depends 
on the number floating structure, it depends on the sample rule. So, and the, the more, uh, the larger the donor acceptor separation, generally the more effect you see. Okay. If the donor and acceptor are, are set very close to, to each other at distances below six nanometer, basically you will not see anything. Uh, lots of groups have tried uh, with short um, DA separations and they have not seen any effect. And essentially, at these distances, um, the threat itself is very efficient in diffraction limited mode, so in, in homogeneous space. So there's not really a, a large effect of the nanophotonics. But if you go to somewhere where, where the reference is pretty bad, so for large donor acceptor separation or for nearly perpendicular donor acceptor separation, then in this case, uh, you can see much more effect of the nanophotonics on, on these threat, uh, threat systems. And also, yes, because of, of, of this question of collective effects, uh, it's, it's much better to use uh, single molecule data and make sure that you're really pointing out single molecules one by one to, to, to analyze this data. Uh, all right, that's it. Um, I'm finishing my time. This is just to, to show up uh, the stuff and I'm happily taking questions. So thanks for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Jerome. Uh, do we have any questions? Ah, yeah, I see a lot of uh, uh, well, some questions from uh, Mikhail Petrov uh, and then from Maxim. Misha? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Uh, Jero, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for a very nice talk. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, so you mentioned that you can, you can track the threat through either through brightness of, of donor or through uh, time decay of the acceptor, right? Uh, actually, it's, it's more um, brightness of acceptor and time decay of, of, of donor. Uh, okay, oh, and uh, time decay of donor, right. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. the threat uh, that we use... Right, right, right. right. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, uh, I'm just, I was just mixing the, the terms. Uh, but that means, so what is, so looks a bit, um, maybe counterintuitive to me. So when you place uh, your donor in this plasmonic environment, so I would think that the ch this channel from, from donor, so I think I would, I would say that much of energy is given to this plasmonic system. So, and that channel from one molecule to another molecule should not be that sufficient. Yeah, so the relative, the, the, the relative energy which is given to another molecule, that's what I'm, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I understand your point. Um, but actually, the other molecule is pretty much in the near field of, of, of um, mm -hmm. molecules. So the field here is, is pretty strong as compared to what we can get um, uh, in, in the emission in the radiative part. Uh, okay. I'm trying to summarize a bit in this mm -hmm. cap, uh, which is Okay, well, I like it because I made it, so I, I understand it, but it's uh, <laughs> pretty difficult to understand. Uh, so this is trying to summarize um, my understanding. So we have donor. Uh, the donor can emit light um, radiatively. Part of it is going mm -hmm. to put it back and send back on here, and this is the personal effect, okay? Radiative emission scattered back and right. Right. changes the life cycle. So this is the LDOS. Um, this thing has not an ideal quantum yield. It has some internal losses, which is the internal non-conversion. And uh, there's also the losses right. that go with quenching to the electrons of the metal. So this is the, the new losses due to plasmonics. Okay. And then there's the presence of the acceptor. Mm -hmm. And the presence of the acceptor, I can always decompose it into two things uh, by, by, by definition, by the threat that is in homogeneous space, um, the superscript zero, what goes in, in confocal mm -hmm. and limited mode. And then the rest, uh, the rest I'm calling what is scattered by the structure okay, here. And if we write completely the equations, uh, actually it's not exactly true to, to write um, this is uh, as a sum of power, um, but actually it's not mm -hmm. as is the electric field. So the electric field, uh, field um, sensed here, emitted by this guy. Uh, then it's a sum of electric field directly emitted here and another part that comes there and these are interfering. Everything is coherent here, of course. So there's a, there's a complex interference between um, 
uh, this part and this part on the electric field. And even if, though this part is, can be pretty small, okay, in the interference pattern, you have also mm -hmm. always the Edrodin term, so the cross term, the two uh, I1, I2, cos phi, um, uh, this, this type of, of, of thing. So with the product of this guy, electric field, times this guy, electric field. And if this thing is, is strong, then the modulation can be strong also. Also, and this is one of one of um, the, 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 the I see, I see. Are, are, mm -hmm. are affecting, and because it's an interference effect, then of course it's making things a lot more complicated. Uh, and, and one while we're still here, so can you compare this loss factor and this gamma thread Z and W, which we call it here? Uh, yes, I, yes. We we have the different values. Um, not sure. I have everything here. Um, Just the order of magnitude, maybe. Mm, yes. So this is for some. Um, uh, in the nano holes, everything is more or less at the same order of magnitude. Uh, but these are some old nano holes. We have a bit better not right now. So the threat rate here is not enhanced a lot, so uh, 1.5 is basically free, um, but we can get a bit better in this case. I'm just looking down. So this is for the antenna, which is things are mm -hmm. um, clearer because it's a resonant di dipole antenna. Um, so here are the different values, um, at least something. So, oops, sorry. I lost my pointer. So for the threat rate, typically five times. Here, um, the L dose typically nine times increase. Uh, the loss is actually this guy. Um, it's a bit hard to really talk about enhancement. So we, here I'm just adding mm -hmm. a certain, certain value. Adding, okay, I see, I see, I see. If you go in the supporting info of this paper, you have um, trying to give all the values um, that we can measure. Okay, thank you. I think okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, Maxim, you had a question too, and I think there is also a question or comment from Konstantin then. Yeah, right. Thank you, Jerem, for the talk. Uh, so I have uh, the following question. Uh, generally, if we're speaking about emission of a molecule in vacuum, then of course the dipole transitions would dominate. But since you are placing the molecules to the plasmonic environment, I wonder if quadruple transitions can be somehow manifested and affect you know, the theoretical description uh, of threat. Uh, we didn't look at in, in this part so far. I, I would believe that this quadrupole would be just some some extra terms um, in in the descriptions. Um, I don't know whether they would turn out to to be spectrally slightly different uh, if there would be some some shift. Uh, right now, particularly, we collect uh, almost everything, so it, it, it's hard to really detect anything. In this. I believe this would uh, affect somehow this angular dependence, uh, the influence of orientation of the molecules uh, on, on, the, on the effect. Mm, yes, 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 for sure. Uh, but right now, um, theoretically, we didn't look at, at, at that. Uh, experimentally, it's, it's always hard because even though we are we are close to zero on, on the kappa square. Um, there is still a bit of wobbling and, and the molecules are not a perfect dipole. So in this case, um, this uh, illustrates also the, um, the difficulties in optics. We are playing with real molecules. Uh, there's not point dipole. So these things have a, a certain size. Uh, the size is a bit below one nanometer, but something 0 0.7 nanometer. But that's not completely negligible when we are um, playing at distances of, of three, four, five nanometer distance. So it's not completely negligible. Uh, and, and this is making things much more complicated. So right. if, if I compare, you will see uh, the presentation from KSAD. Um, at the microwave, then the control here is, is tremendously better. Okay, extremely, extremely better. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Constantine, I see your mic is on. Uh, do you have a question? Maybe a question. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Oh, quite hard, but yes. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I will uh, turn on my head. So maybe now it is better. Yes, is yeah, it now, now it's better, better. yeah. yeah, yeah it's now better. it is better, okay. So I didn't uh, want to uh, raise this uh, issue, but uh, because it was mentioned by Maxim, uh, I will uh, tell that I thought uh, last time 
about uh, magnetic fret. Uh, you know that there are um, magnetic optical transitions in some uh, metal organic molecules. Yes. And uh, this is a new chapter of, of nanophotonics. And uh, I uh, tried to find some works about um, fret between magnetic uh, donor and acceptor, and they didn't find. So probably it is uh, interesting, a uh, new chapter of nanophotonics. If we take a magnetic antenna uh, uh, and use a magnetic mirror resonance, for example, or something like this, and uh, uh, learn uh, the uh, fret uh, between uh, magnetic optical transitions. What do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think it's, you're, you're raising an interesting uh, point. I, I don't have any other knowledge also. I know in Paris, uh, Mathieu Mivel is working on magnetic dipole transitions with, uh, with the electric nanophotonics and, and magnetic mirror resonances also. Um, but, but so far, as much as I'm aware, uh, there have only been major consideration only for, for uh, uh, single, uh, si single dipole uh, in this case. So magnetic dipole fret, uh, no, would, but it would be interesting. Uh, for, for sure. Yes, yes, that's what I mean. It's a, it's a new field uh, which needs to be uh, labored. And nobody, well, uh, to my, to uh, my uh, yes. knowledge, nobody uh, tried to, to labor it. Well, uh, essentially, no, all, all the things that were done with electric dipoles, um, in this case, can, can, can be studied in, in, in this context, yes. Yes. So now my own questions. Um, you mentioned that if the distance between the donor and the acceptor is as small as one, two nanometers, uh, fret uh, vanishes. Is it correct? Uh, I would say that if the distance is as small as one or uh, is below two nanometer, then in this case we can no longer um, uh, fret is no longer the dominating process. Then in this case we have a direct electron transfer. This is called the Dexter electron transfer. Yes. So, so there, there's electron tunneling directly from one molecule to uh -huh. a molecule. And yes, yes, uh, I agree. The, the relevant of point. course, of course, this is the tunneling. Mm -hmm. I agree that the tunneling starts dominating. But what about uh, the following reason why fret may disappear. Um, uh, no, I, I don't think that strong. fret may disappear. I just think that in this case, um, in this case, we, we would need to start to have a quantum description probably, and, yes. and considering the, the donor dipole and the acceptor dipole as two separate systems, I think would be would be conceptually wrong in this case. Yes, yes. To be uh, one single system that may show yes. a strong to, Yes, absolutely. To my understanding, uh, the strong uh, coupling uh, makes uh, this dimer a unique uh, a quantum system uh, with uh, totally different uh, levels of, of energy. And uh, there is no any more uh, the uh, the resonance uh, between optical transitions in in these two um, quantum emitters, and that's uh, that's why we cannot tell about fret in principle if the uh, coupling between two uh, molecules is uh, strong. So, to my understanding, fret is the uh, phenomenon which corresponds to the to the quite weak coupling between yeah. the. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's, you're, you're that's totally right. Yes, yes, yes. Because I'm not expert, and I wish to understand. No, no, no. Uh, uh, I, I know that Thomas Sebesson uh, has done uh, two papers on, on, on energy transfer in strong coupling. Strong coupling. So, in strong coupling, still fret is possible. Uh, there is signs of, of energy transfer. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, but in this case, there's a splitting of the energy level of, of the donor and the acceptor. So, it's, it's making things uh, much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, the, and this splitting uh, makes the energy level not equal uh, for the uh, for the yeah, mutual but, photons. But if the, if the cavity is is correctly designed, then there can still be some overlap between one and ah okay okay in the one, cavity uh, this, lower yes, two and, and, and I, I understand I understand the point yes very good uh, next you mentioned uh, that um, in a plasmonic dimer. Uh, the uh, enhancement of fret uh, uh, was described by a me theory. I didn't understand this point. If it is a plasmonic dimer, 
Why you tell about me uh, resonances? It's uh, it's uh, not me. yeah yeah. I, I, actually, we we use the the, the, the code uh, to to compute the, the, the me theory. Uh, uh, this electric field uh, was computed using the code to, um, uh, that we used to implement to, uh, for the me theory simulations. So the, the, this code still works? Uh, you mean generalized me model still still yeah. works for, for yeah. such a small separation? Yeah. Okay, very good. But well, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's not, not very important. Uh, next uh, question. Uh, this is uh, my own idea, uh, number two. Uh, I thought about non-radiative FRET. In the usual scheme of FRET, uh, the donor uh, transmit, uh, transfers the energy to the acceptor and the acceptor uh, um, emits the, uh, the photon. Uh, if the acceptor can't emit the photon, for example, uh, if uh, the, um, uh, it uh, submerged to relaxation by some reasons, is it possible to use FRET for extreme heating of the acceptor? Uh, yes, but I'm, I'm not sure that in this case, uh, there won't be an, any back FRET. And if uh, I'm not sure that in this case, FRET is going to be enhanced uh, at all. Uh, uh, I would rather suspect that if the acceptor cannot give back the, the energy, that uh, it's, it's not going to decrease non-relatively, but it's going to be sent back. To, to the donor. Uh -huh. So you think but you're raising an, an interesting question that what occurs if I put the donor in a photonic band gap, for instance? Yes, yes, that's what the donor my, my in such a position, but exactly. it cannot emit, uh, then yes. normally the threat should be enhanced. Yes, and this. Uh, uh, but as Kaiser is going to show, it, it's not exactly the case, at least not in a cavity. Uh, I thought it would, it would be the case, um, but it's, it's not working like that. So if you go, in the band gap, where the, the, donor, in, the donor emission is quenched, uh, I thought we would have a super high threat, and actually it's not the case. The threat also is quenched. So everything is quenched in, in, in the band gap. Which is, uh, and everything is, is quenched in the band gap, you think. But uh, I, don't, I don't think so if, we are, if uh, our structure is, is located on the surface of the photonic crystal. Mm, yeah, possibly, possibly. <laughs> I was just discussing so, cases where we show just a planar cavity. Okay, okay. And this was my next uh, question. And my, my next idea was also to, uh, to try to use the Bragg mirror uh, for the large area um, fret phenomenon. Uh, if we want to observe uh, fret in the big uh, ensembles of, of uh, donor acceptor pairs, it would be quite crazy to prepare the uh, the uh, array of, of nano antennas and so on and so on. But mm -hmm. we may increase uh, locally the, the field using the surface state of the photonic crystal. Uh, uh, well, this is just uh, just an idea to, to discuss. It's not a question. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Konstantin. Uh, um, I don't see any questions more. I, I had one about the orientational dependence, uh, where you studied by uh, attaching uh, dipoles directly to DNA. Do you think? And mm -hmm. I think what uh, you use you have here is just uh, like uh, discrete uh, num discrete uh, states, uh, either uh, parallel or perpendicular uh, dipoles, right? Uh, yes, yes, it, it's, and it depends. Uh, the dyes are, are, are stacking mm -hmm. on, on the, the dyes are here are stacking, uh, and here also. And because of the double helix, um, by if we increase the distance, then at some point we make one rotate to each other. Uh, can, can, can you have uh, it uh, like a variable distance between them by adjusting like temperature or? the structure of the helix is very stable and doesn't uh, change with uh, no i don't think it would change but if we increase much more if we increase the temperature we we may just increase the wobbling much more than the, yeah. the yeah. distance uh, and probably if we increase more than 60 degree um the double strand is quite short here it, it may just dissociate uh, just <laughs> yeah okay in, in this case okay thank you Gerard. Well, actually that's that's some of the limits of of mm -hmm molecular preparation of the samples uh, in microwave, then in this case, we can have a much better control on the orientation and the distance. Okay, thank you. Uh, with, with Kaiser. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we
Thank you. Uh, and we would uh, move on to our next okay. picture. I'm, I'm uh, stop this.